Woohoo! If you've made it this far, if you're watching this video, that means we are almost finished. This is the very final project in the final week or two of the course, and this is a really challenging course and a really challenging project. And so I want to thank you for all the work that you've given to this course so far and all the work that you will give in this project and all of the work that you will give on your final exam. Uh, these, this final project and your final exam are going to be hallmarks of how you uh, have done so far in the course and how, you, how well you will do with using statistics in your everyday life. So I really appreciate it. Uh, if you happen to interview for a job that uses statistics and data-driven analysis, then I would absolutely encourage you to take this project report along as part of your portfolio to demonstrate and prove an evidence-based proof, right, for an evidence-based job, to prove to your future employer that you have worked hard and have a deep and thorough understanding of the most important aspects of statistics. And so this project, as you can imagine, is going to be quite challenging, the most challenging project that we do in the course. And um, uh, next to the exams, probably the most challenging assignment we will complete in the course as well. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump in and get started. This is a big video for uh, the project because I'm really trying to explain in detail all the aspects and all the elements that will maximize and optimize your grade for the, the entire project. But I'm going to try to break it up if I can figure out how to do so. I've never done it before. Um, but I'm going to try to break it up into uh, little elements that you can jump around in in YouTube segments that you can uh, go to the exact spot that you need. Also, I'm going to have little pause opportunities in the video for you to do the work yourself using this data set that I'm about to show you. And uh, when you pause the video, you can do the work yourself and then check yourself because I'm going to go over the answers. Uh, so here is the data set that we're doing for this video. This is based on a previous term in the 2019-2020 school year. Students decided that they wanted to take a look at Trump's presidency and normally I avoid political topics like the plague, especially in this day and age uh, where the political climate is so incredibly volatile, but this was a particularly congenial class and they were respectful to each other. So I allowed uh, them to come up with the hypotheses they wanted and their hypotheses, we did one hypothesis that was meant for proportions and one hypothesis that was meant for means. And I'll let you determine which is which. Uh, and the first hypothesis they came up with, um, it was uh, the data that you see was the data from just that class. Uh, and But the hypothesis uh, I specified would be about all Austin P at Fort Campbell students. So the first hypothesis is Austin P at Fort Campbell students rate Trump's presidency on average more than 4.5. And for context, that's on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is the worst and 10 is the best. And you see the data that they responded with there on Trump's presidency. And then the second hypothesis says that most Austin P at Fort Campbell students identify as politically conservative. And then you see their results right there. Those who identified as conservative, those who identified as liberal, and those who identified as other, which were the only three options that we gave for that question. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take that data and construct a 95% confidence interval for proportions. You determine which of these two data sets is the appropriate one for proportions, and then you determine how to construct the interval. And we're just looking for the actual interval here, the 95% confidence interval. So I'm going to pause now, and or I'm going to show the pause button now, and you have the option to pause and actually construct this interval and then I'm going to go over the answer.
Okay, so if you paused, you will have your answer and you can compare it to my answer. Uh, and so what I did was I took my calculator and I'm only giving you the brief steps, not the detailed steps, because there's another video that will show you in detail how to actually use your calculator. But by this point, you've been doing confidence intervals and hypotheses tests for a couple of weeks, probably um, at least a week, but maybe even two weeks. And so I, I'm going to assume that you're pretty familiar with this process. And so you're going to want to go to the stat button and then scroll right to test and then select alpha A or scroll down to it says one prop Z int for one um, proportion Z interval. And then what you're going to do is you're going to enter uh, three was our number of data values that were conservative. Uh, and so that's why we have, uh, so we see the conservative, there were three conservative. Um, so our category of interest, since we're hypothesizing about political political and conservative, that's why we choose the three. So the interval should be based on which value you're hypothesizing on. And so the category we hypothesized about was three. The total number of responses was nine. We have a 95% interval, uh, and so we calculate. And that means that we have 0.02 535 and point, uh, 0.64131 and that's actually the final answer to. Sometimes the calculator will give uh, a negative answer for the minimum or a value of more than one for the maximum. That's not actually possible so if that happens uh, then you should change your answer here uh, because the calculator is actually incorrect when it does that. Um, if you have a negative minimum, you should say the minimum of the confidence interval is zero for proportions because remember proportions and probability all, always, always, always have to be between zero and one. And so likewise, if it said more than one on your calculator output, your actual answer should be one. So definitely remember four proportions at least to follow by those rules that they always have to be between zero and one. And then now what we want to do is our confidence interval interpretation. And uh, you may have seen me, if you're in my face-to-face -face class, you may have seen me lay out uh, what should be the elements of the interpretation. If you're in my online class, you have seen me discuss the elements of the interpretation in the chapter eight discussion. So I'm going to uh, put up the pause sign and that's your symbol to pause if you want to work this problem out for yourself. And so now we are going to go over the answer. Uh, the answer we've already gotten for the actual interval, uh, that is the answer here. And so, but our interpretation is going to be based off that answer. So we should say that we can be 95% confident. So I'll be looking for the 95% that between uh, and oftentimes we want to convert proportions to percentages, and that's just to make it more easily understood. Our interpretation is supposed to be written so hopefully that anybody can understand it. That's our goal, is to say what this confidence interval means in the simplest terms possible while still accurately describing the interval. And most people think more in terms of percentages, like 64.1% means a lot more than saying 0.64131. Uh, it, it gives a lot more context. People relate better to 64.1%. Um, so we can be 95% confident, uh, confident that between 2.5% and 64.1% of all Austin P. at Fort Campbell students are politically conservative. So 
Um, and I put a little note down here that we've not confirmed the assumptions for the interval. We will do that when we do the hypothesis test. Um, so I just stuck that little note down here. Now in grading, let me tell you what I'm going to be looking for when I go to grade these projects. I'm going to look to make sure that you mentioned your percentage of confidence. And I ideally want uh, the minimum and the maximum of the interval themselves to be expressed in percentages. And the category must be clearly identified. So here, politically conservative was our category of interest. That category has to be in the interpretation. Uh, the population should ideally be clearly identified. In other words, you're telling me what the population is or at a bare minimum, the word population has to be included. Uh, so here you'll notice that instead of the word population, I said what the population was. So you definitely want one or the other. I prefer you saying what the population is. So I said all Austin P at Fort Campbell students. So that way it is completely clear who you're making these conclusions about. And then uh, the minimum and the maximum of the interval, which, um, like I said, in two is going to be expressed as percentages, ideally. And then the right words to put all of the elements together. You can phrase it just like I have, except the underlying stuff will be changed depending on your level of confidence. For the projects, though, go ahead and use a 95% level of confidence. So that shouldn't change for the projects. But if you were doing something else, the um, interpretation might change. And then um, this is going to be different because you're going to have your own answers based on your own data. Uh, this will be different because you or probably be different because you probably didn't choose all Austin Peay for Campbell students as your target population for your projects. And then your uh, actual category of interest will be different. Uh, and then we'll grade on all of those things. And if you have that, all of those elements, you will do quite well. And now I want you to uh, choose, and it hopefully will be pretty obvious, which one is the appropriate interval uh, data for the interval for means. So I want you to construct a confidence interval for means, and I am going to give you a few seconds to pause this video and work that out for yourself before I go over the answer. Okay, so now let's go over our answers. Here we have, uh, we want to enter our data first into the calculator. Um, so I'm using the data option, which you're instructed to use the data option for this one, but that means the first step is to enter our data. So if we go back, we want to enter these nine data values into L1. So we would press stat edit, 1, enter, 2, enter, 3.7, enter, and so on and so forth till we get all nine data values into the calculator. And then once we do that, we will uh, press stat again, scroll over to test, and select option 8 or scroll down to the T interval option. We want the T interval option but instead of Z because we don't know the population standard deviation sigma. We just gathered this data. We don't have any idea about the data. And that's true of any real life. So um, any real life situation, you're almost always going to want to use T instead of Z. And that's, in fact, exactly what we do here because we don't know the population standard deviation of the mean rating or of the ratings for uh, president, uh, the president. So here we would select the data option because again that's the one that we're told to use in our project three. Uh, we have our data in L1 with a frequency of one and our confidence level is 95 percent uh, and that's what we want to use in the projects as well. And so then we have our output and 
Also in the projects, you're uh, instructed to give 100% of the output that your calculator gives, and I'll be looking for that. So here, 3.3341 is I'm giving every single digit. I'm not just giving three significant digits, but every digit that the calculator gives. And then uh, 7.9326, every digit that the calculator gives, just as the Project 3 instructions specify. And now we will pause to give you a chance to do the interpretation for this means interval. And so here is the interval itself again. This is what we already got last time. And I'm going to uh, interpret that interval. Uh, so we can be 95% because that's the level of confidence and that's the level of confidence you'll be using in your projects as well. Um, that and then here Austin P at Fort Campbell students or all Austin P at Fort Campbell students uh, will be our population. So we've specified the population. And then um, rating Trump's presidency is the variable. Uh, so you could rephrase this differently as um, Trump's presidential ratings or Trump's presidential favorability ratings. Uh, so there's a few ways that you could phrase that, but these three words together are the variable. And so your variable for the projects will be different, but that's what the variable we're using here is. Uh, and then you always want to have on average or the mean or something to denote that this is not a single data value or a single person's response uh, or not everybody's response will be between these uh, three. We saw as low as one, as high as nine in our data. So not all of our responses or not 95% of all of our responses will be in this interval. It's the average that will be in this interval. So that word on average has to be in there somewhere or the mean of, um, and then uh, between the minimum and the maximum. So that has to be part of the interpretation as well. Uh, and so I'll be looking for all of these elements and specifically I've listed out every single element that I'll be looking for. I'll be looking for you to say the percentage of the confidence, the, um, to use the word mean or average, uh, to have the variable itself clearly identified, the population itself clearly identified, or you could use the word population, but ideally the the population clearly identified is the better of those two choices. The minimum and the maximum of the interval, and if the if there are units associated uh, with that, uh, here ratings don't have units, but if you're doing like miles per gallon, uh, then the miles per gallon should between three and four miles per gallon, or well, uh, that would be a really bad <laughs> efficiency, but uh, um, something like that. So there are a lot of a lot of these interval means intervals uh, that will have units. And then the right words to put all these things together. So that's those are the things that I'll be grading on. And now we're jumping into the big hypotheses test. And hypotheses plural, so I want you to give the um, multiple hypotheses that are appropriate for running the proportions test. And again, I'm going to let you choose which data set is appropriate for proportions and let you uh, hypothesize about what your hypotheses should be here. Um, and again, the stuff in purple is the stuff that we're trying to prove. So what are the appropriate hypotheses for that situation? And I'll pause. Okay, so the hypotheses you should have come up with are P equals 0.5 or P is greater than 0.5. P stands for proportion, the population proportion P. Um, specifically, it stands for proportion, but when it doesn't have the hat or the apostrophe, 
on top of it or after it. Um, that's the population proportion that it represents. So you should not have mu here. The mu is only for means test. Uh, so I'll be looking for the P for proportions test. And then we said most, and the word most means more than half. Uh, so the thing that we're trying to prove is our alternative hypothesis, and our alternative hypothesis is more than half. And you could have written 1 over 2 instead of 0 0.5, but we usually write these things as decimals, so I wrote out 0 0.5. So our population proportion P is more than half, and that means that most are conservative. And of course P would represent the proportion of people who would respond, of all of our Austin P at Fort Campbell students, who would respond that they are conservative. And then our null hypothesis is that the population proportion P is equal to half. Um, you could have done less than or equal to here uh, instead of exactly equal to, but usually we just do equals for the null hypothesis symbol. So I will be looking for you to label which is the null and which is the alternative. I'll be looking for the P. Um, I will be looking for the equal to or the less than or equal to symbol here. Um, I will be looking for half on both of these and I'll be looking for the greater than symbol here. And now we want to do the assumptions. What are our assumptions? And this is probably the part that um, people most often lose credit on. Uh, so be sure to get the assumptions right. As a hint, they are written in your textbook. And so you can look at the assumptions that are appropriate for the proportions test and apply it to this particular scenario and tell me exactly why each assumption is or isn't met. Um, and that that all together is, is a big reason why uh, most points that are lost are lost in this little area for both the proportions test and the means test, I should say. Okay, so I'll pause and give you some uh, time to look that up and think about it. Okay, so as I promised you, the assumptions are written in your textbook. I can't remember what page this was on, uh, but you will find this page in your textbook in Chapter 9. And I think it's pretty far along in Chapter 9. So I think they talk about how to compute the um, z-score and the uh, p-value and the t-score and the p-value and all that stuff before they even talk about assumptions. And so, uh, but if you search on the word assumptions, uh, you should be able to find it pretty easily. But certainly if you search on several of these words like um, hypothesis test of a single population proportion p, um, I bet you would be able to find it right away if you spell everything correctly. <laughs> and so that's what we want. We want the proportions one. And there are two different assumptions for proportions according to our textbook. Uh, and that's what we'll go by is our textbook. The first is that we have a simple random sample. And so on your projects, you'll have to go back and look at probably project one and the feedback for project one and say, did you really have a simple random sample? And for us, we will go back and look at the way we collected our data. We're making conclusions about the entire population of Austin P at Fort Campbell students, but we only collected data from the class that was taking statistics from me, that particular term, my face-to-face -face class. So um, that was not a simple random sample. Spoiler alert, I guess I should say, but I'm about to go over the specific answers anyway. Uh, and then the second assumption is that the number of successes and the number of successes is X, but X happens to be N times P as well. If, um, and then the number of failures, and that's N times the complement of P, which is Q, um, both of those actually have to be greater than five. So for our case, the number of people who answered that they were conservative and the number of people who answered something other than conservative 
uh, both of those numbers have to be greater than five. We failed that one too because we only had three conservative answers. So uh, here um, I've actually flip-flopped them. Sorry about that because um, n times our hypothesized proportion. Uh, so nine times our hypothesized proportion is four and a half. Um, and nine times our hypothesized proportion. So instead of going for the actual, um, I believe the textbook wants you to go for the hypothetical. So take your actual n and your hypothesized proportion instead of looking at how many were actually saying conservative and how many were actually saying other. Uh, so I told you a little bit wrong about that. Sorry about that. Um, but take your hypothesized proportion and your actual n um, and multiply them together. And then the complement of n is what goes here. It turns out our complement our, our complement of p0 turns out because we did half um, in our hypotheses uh, that the complement of half is half because one minus half is half. And so both of these are less than five. So we failed this first assumption. Um, we've also failed the simple random sample assumption because it was not, we did not take the entire list of all Austin P at Fort Campbell students. We didn't even have that list, but a simple random sample would take it, the entire list of one or two thousand, I would assume, Austin P at Fort Campbell students and either put them in a hat, all of their names in a hat, which would be huge because 1,000 even would just be too much for a normal size hat and it would be too much to too much work to do in fact or the easier way would be to take the list that the registrar gives us for the Austin Peay for Campbell students and have them in Excel and number them one through um, 1500 or however many there are and then use a random number generator to generate um, Ideally, more than nine numbers, we'd want, you know, maybe 30 numbers. Uh, and then uh, those 30 numbers are the ones that we're going to track down and survey uh, that correspond to 30 students. So that would be a simple random sample. That's not what we did. We sampled only those in our class. And so that's the reason that we have failed the simple random sample assumption. And then I want you to actually compute the test statistic and the p-value and I'm showing you the data again in case you need the data to do the test statistic and the p-value and I'll go ahead and pause here. Okay, so here is what I got. Um, hopefully you still have the data in L1. If not, it's not too much to type in. Um, okay, and so now we will go over the results. Uh, so you will do stat, test, and option five. Option five is the one prop Z test. So since we're doing proportions, we're going to want the one prop Z test. If you look at your formula card, that's the only option. And uh, so this is our menu or the menu that I have on my calculator, but it's probably pretty similar to the menu that you will have too. You might not have the color, but you would have uh, P0 and the proportion symbol. Uh, so if we look at, um, if we were to look back to our actual hypotheses, then that would help us with the first entry and the last entry. So our actual hypotheses were here. Um, so our alternative hypothesis specifically, our first entry will be the value and our last entry will be the symbol. And so our first entry 
um, is the value of half and our last entry is the greater than symbol because of our alternative hypothesis and then the three is the number of people who actually responded conservative and the nine is the total number of people we had in our data collection and when we do that we will get a z-score of exactly negative one and a p-value and we've got to write down every single digit the calculator gives us and that's part of the project instructions so 0 0.8413447404 I should mention that also as part of the project instructions before you do any of these steps that we have been doing you will give the calculator output and the mini tab output and compare those two things so calculator output mini tab output and compare those two things and then you will do assumptions hypotheses and repeat the test statistic and the p-value uh, and then you will give your, your conclusion statement that we're about to do uh, so again here are the test statistic and the p-value be sure to label them very clearly like this is the test statistic and this is the p-value instead of uh, giving all of the output that the entire calculator gives so that I know that you know what the test statistic is because if you're going to give all of this calculator output then I'm not going to be sure that you know which is the test statistic from here uh, so be sure that you kind of say what the test statistic is and what you, you say what the p-value is. And then the final step, and this is for the proportions, we're going to do the same for means though. The final step is to give your decision and conclusion statements and I'll give you a chance to do that. Okay, so our decision statement should be um, because our p-value is enormous and we can go back and look at the p-value, um, our p-value is just enormous. And so because it is so large uh, and it's certainly greater than 0 0.05, and by the way, 0 0.05 is what you should use for your alpha for your projects. Um, anytime p is larger than alpha, we do not reject the null hypothesis. When we do not reject the null hypothesis, we do not conclude anything. Um, and so our conclusion statement should we be something similar, very similar to we do not have sufficient evidence to conclude or we cannot conclude or at the 5% significance level, we do not have sufficient evidence to conclude that a majority of Austin P. at Fort Campbell students, or you could say most Austin P. at Fort Campbell students, are politically conservative. And so we're basically taking our original um, thing that we wanted to prove and we are rephrasing it to say whether we could or could not prove that thing. So remember, all the way back to our original data set um, where we said that we wanted to prove most Austin P. at Fort Campbell students identify as politically conservative. So we rephrase that into whether we can or cannot conclude that most Austin P. at Fort Campbell students are politically conservative. And um, that's essentially what I've done here. And you want to check to make sure you've met all of the elements. The elements that I'll be looking for is saying something along the lines of we can or cannot conclude or there is or is not sufficient data to conclude something that, um, you know, really focuses on something that means whether or not we can conclude. And then uh, for proportions, we want to give it in terms of percentage ideally so um, when we talk about the alternative hypothesis value we usually give it in terms of percentage uh, so greater than 50 percent uh, here though uh, sometimes there's a more efficient way of saying greater than 50 percent so majority or most is synonymous with greater than 50 percent uh, so we don't always use percentage um, but 
if if it had been something like 75 percent you could have said three quarters uh, but most people would say 75 percent certainly 80 percent or or if you had something uh, more specific like that a percentage would be better to state than in terms of proportions most of the time and then we want to identify our category clearly in the uh, and that's the politically conservative part um, that's our category of interest. Uh, we want to identify the population clearly. So that was all Austin P at Fort Campbell students. We want to say the alternative symbol in words. Um, and uh, so, you know, that would be greater than in this case, but majority implies greater than 50%. Uh, and then we want to say the alternative hypothesis value. Um, sometimes in words, sometimes just actually giving the value. And then we want all of the right words to put those things together. For our last set, the hypothesis uh, means test. And so I'm going to let you choose your data. And if you've been watching the whole video, I'm sure you know which data set to choose. Uh, so choose your own set of data, the data that's most appropriate for the means test and go ahead and complete uh, the beginning the hypotheses for this means test using that data and that original uh, statement in the bright purple that we're trying to prove and oh yeah note the plural so you're looking for two different hypotheses uh, so that's a big hint there on that one and pause the video and you do it and then I'll come back and give the answer. Okay, so here are our hypotheses. We want our alternative hypothesis to always represent the thing that we're trying to prove. And so if we go back here and we look um, at our two hypotheses or our two sets of data, we notice the quantitative data, and that's going to be the one that's most appropriate for the means test, by the way, the quantitative data. And the statement that goes with the quantitative data is that AP at Fort Campbell students rate President Trump's presidency on average as more than 4.5. And so we're going to try to put this into symbols. Well, means is for the population mean mu, and so our symbol should be mu, and then more than 4.5 would be greater than 4.5. So again, with our alternative hypothesis being the statement we're trying to prove, mu is greater than 4.5. I will be looking for uh, the alternative hypothesis to be clearly identified, the null hypothesis to be clearly identified. For the means test, the population uh, symbol for the population mean mu should be present on both hypotheses. The um, appropriate symbol based on what you're trying to prove for the alternative hypothesis should be there. Uh, the value of what you're trying to prove should be the same on both of these. And in general, the null hypothesis symbol should always be equal to. Or uh, you can choose the complement. So with this one being greater than, we could have a symbol of less than or equal to. Um, so n most of the time, I think you'd see exactly equal to as the null. Um, but if you choose less than or equal to, that would also have been marked correct. And then I will let you do the assumptions for the means test. And as I said on the assumptions for the proportions test, this is the most difficult part, the part where uh, most groups lose the most points in general because uh, this is quite tough. Uh, you want to tell each of the assumptions, and as a hint, the assumptions are in the book, the textbook, uh, in Chapter 9, and you want to more than tell the assumptions, you want to say exactly why in this scenario, or for the projects, in your project scenario, uh, the assumption is or is not met on each one of those assumptions. So I'm going to pause and give you an opportunity to look those up and to uh, think about those, maybe even write some stuff down, and then I'll come back and tell you the right answers.
Okay, uh, here are the answers on this one. Uh, and I didn't give the textbook, but we'll jump back to the textbook. So the textbook, um, here I have highlighted for proportions, but we're doing the means test now. Uh, so we'd want to jump up to means, and we want to use the t-test, not the z-test. The second paragraph is for the z-test. Uh, so we want to use the t-test. Um, and... Uh, it says use the sample standard deviation. I'm not making that an assumption though, because every data set has, um, every quantitative data set has a standard deviation. So that's not really one of the assumptions. Uh, the two assumptions are that you have a simple random sample. And that's true of every single one of these, by the way. Um, a simple random sample, simple random sample, simple random sample. So you'll want to go back and check on whether or not you have a simple random sample. And we covered that in project one, and I gave feedback on that in project one. Uh, so that would be a nice place to look on those projects. Um, here, I'll give some logic as to why or why not. What we did um, is a simple random sample. And then, oh, and the textbook is also a great place to look at simple random samples as well. Um, and then uh, the second assumption is that the population distribution is approximately normal. Uh, and this gets a little more complicated than that, and we'll talk about that. Um, uh, it does say in parenthesis, note that if the sample size is sufficiently large, the population will work even if it's not approximately normal. So we'll mention that as well. Uh, so going back here, um, so our first assumption is that the data are normally distributed. Um, and so I'm looking at the histogram and the histogram is not normal. Uh, so it's not symmetrical. It's a little bell-shaped, but it's, it's not enough bell-shaped because it's not symmetrical um, and it's a little bit skewed. And so uh, we don't have data. Now, if we had 30 data values and it looks like this, um, and especially if it were a two-tailed test, I would say, yeah, yeah, the data is close enough. Um, it's a two-tailed test. Uh, we've got at least 30 data. We don't have 30 data values. We only have nine data values. And so knowing that we only have nine data values, knowing that it's a one-sided test, and knowing that the data does not look, does not look that close to normal, um, all of those things put together, I'm going to say we failed this one. Now, this one's a pretty close to call thing. So if you had argued that um, this was quite close to normal, uh, the data was quite close to normal, and by the time you got through nine iterations, um, a sample size of nine with nine iterations, that it would be close enough to normal to go ahead. Um, if you argued that well, I would uh, not take off points. But I think that uh, in this case, it, it is too dangerous to use the hypothesis test. It would not have been if we had had 30 data values. Probably even for a one-sided test, I would, I would say it's, it's, it's good to go because we have 30 data values. Here we don't, though. And then the second assumption is the uh, simple random sample assumption. And in order to have a simple random sample, the textbook describes two different ways that you can do a simple random sample. And they're pretty much the only two ways that you can do a simple random sample. One of them is to cut up all the names in the entire population, write them down on pieces of paper and cut them up um, so that you have little slips of paper and put them in a hat and shuffle them up and then draw out however many names you want to survey. That's not what we did. <laughs> we didn't take the entire population of all Austin P. at Fort Campbell students and cut them up. Um, that would have been a thousand or two thousand names uh, to put into a hat, and we didn't do that. We also, the second way is to have a list of all of the names of the people and to use some sort of random uh, number generator to choose numbers that correspond to the students because you can number them alphabetically or however you want to. Uh, the numbers are generated at random, so even if you number them with uh, an alphabetized list, um, the 
those people will be chosen random because the numbers themselves are random. And so if you choose uh, based on the number random number generator um, from the entire population, that's important uh, to note, then you do have a simple random sample from the entire population and you would have been good to go here. We didn't have anything close to that. We had a very biased sample of only the people that happened to be in our class, a convenience sample um, to the extreme, and so it was biased. And then uh, I will let you do the test statistic and the p-value, and uh, you can pause the video here and go back to the data set. Actually, let me show you the data set and remember that you're computing uh, the test statistic and the p-value um, so go ahead and pause the video now okay hopefully you have uh, pause the video and you have um, computed both the test statistic and the p-value using your calculator and you've reported all those digits uh, so we'll go ahead and look at that answer now uh, so we're doing the means test so we would have put the data into the calculator those nine data values that I just showed you hopefully while you're pausing the screen uh, and if you didn't still already have them in your calculator from doing the uh, confidence interval for the means interval, uh, then you could have paused the video right there, entered the nine data values into L1, and then after that, um, you would press the stat key, scroll to the right to test, do option two for the t-test, and uh, once you are on the t-test, you want to choose the data option, and that's part of the project specification that you want to enter all of the data and use the data option. Our first entry and our last entry of the hypothesis test depend on the hypothesis values. Uh, let me let me go back to that our hypothesis, particularly the alternative hypothesis, because that's the thing that we're trying to prove. So our first entry is the value, our second entry is, or I mean our last entry is the alternative hypothesis symbol. So we see that our first entry is the 4.5, our last entry is the greater than, and our list is an L1 with a frequency of 1. By the way, if you have like 100 data values and uh, a lot of the data values repeat, it might be better to look at your tally from project two and to do one list as the unique data values and the second list as the frequency of those values. And if you did it that way, then you would have L1 right here and L2 right here because, uh, for instance, if you were doing ratings from 1 to 10 and you had 100 different ratings that you gathered and uh, 20 of them were a rating of 5, then you could just type 5 ones and a frequency in your frequency list you'd have 20. So it saves a lot of typing that way is what I'm saying. So if you have 100 data values, it might be to your benefit to do that. Um, if you only have 30 data values, it's probably just best to just go um, by the data, the raw data and put the raw data all into all 30 data values into L1. Um, and then you would have a frequency of one like we do here. And when you do all of that and you hit calculate, it tells you your alternative hypothesis right here so you can go back and double check to make sure that that alternative hypothesis says exactly the same thing that our alternative hypothesis said and in fact it does um, and then you've got your t-score and your p-value by the way on the projects uh, you want all the digits written down from your calculator so especially on the first part of the hypothesis test where you'll give the mini tab output and the calculator output, I'll be looking for the calculator output to report all of the digits that the entire calculator gave you, um, which is what I've done here. 
And then uh, I want on the test statistic and p-value portion of your report, I want you to be very specific about which one's the test statistic and which one's the p-value in telling me that. And then we're at the very last one, finally. Uh, so on this very last one, please tell me your decision uh, whether to reject or not to reject the null, and then your conclusion statement. And I will pause and let you consider that. Okay, so first the decision. The decision should be to compare p to alpha. If p is less than or equal to alpha, we reject. If p is more than alpha, we do not reject. Here p was more than alpha, so we said we do not reject the null hypothesis. When we do not reject the null, we do not have evidence to conclude that the alternative is true, but we want to phrase that in the language, um, common everyday language, that tells us all of the things that I'll be um, looking for when I grade. So we want to put it in the context of the original problem, in other words. So we always want to say whether or not we have evidence to conclude um, or whether or not we can conclude. So that's a necessary element that I have highlighted there in purple and blue. Uh, and that whether or not we have evidence, of course, is based on whether or not we reject. If we reject, we do. If we don't reject, we don't have evidence to conclude. Um, and then we want to include, ideally we want to include a description of the population. But if we don't include that description, and here we did, Austin Peay for Campbell students, if we didn't say that, we should say um, the entire population mean um, or the population average uh, to indicate that this is not just for our data that we collected, this is making conclusions um, based on that data on what the entire population would look like. And we want to give our variable, um, so our variable here are Trump presidential approval ratings, and so you can say that several different ways. And uh, we want to include the word average or mean, make sure that's in there. We want to include the alternative hypothesis symbol in words, and we want to include the alternative hypothesis value. And um, I did put a note down here, and I think this is a good idea, because I want you to do all of the steps, um, even if you fail your assumptions like we did. But at the same time, your conclusion is ab absolutely irrelevant if you failed your assumptions. If you didn't fail your assumptions, though, your conclusion is completely valid, um, and we are at least 95% confident if our alpha is 5%. Um, if we do conclude, we're at least 95% confident that that is true. Uh, but here, since we didn't meet our assumptions, uh, the conclusion is actually irrelevant. And I think that's kind of important to say. And so I would recommend saying that if it happens that you do not meet one or more of your assumptions, it would be nice to say that. Uh, so the things that I will be looking for as I grade this, again, are whether we can or cannot conclude, and, you know, I want that to be correct, that you've correctly said whether we can or cannot conclude. Uh, I want to see the word mean or average in your statement. I want the variable to be in there uh, as clearly identified. I'd like for the population to be identified, but if not, it must contain the word population in the uh, report conclusion statement. Uh, the alternative hypothesis symbol in words and the alternative hypothesis value. Uh, and it's possible to say something like we did on on the proportion test. So sometimes it's possible to say something that's synonymous with the symbol instead of saying what the actual symbol is in words. Um, I don't think that's very likely on this test, though, as likely as it is on the proportions test, more likely on the proportions test. Um, and then on the means test, we might actually have units. We did not have units here, but um, it's very likely that you'll have units. So if there are units like dollars or miles per gallon or um, feet, or inches, uh, any kind of units, please get the units.
and then give the right words to put all of these things together. So that's what I'll be looking for. And that's the project. Thank you.